I see, Herit, you have some more yeah. questions or comments coming in. We, we have another question going viral. So another topic, and I don't know if you guys in the audience, we, we don't see anybody stand up and raise their hand and put a question, but if you're still in that Slido slash Ica world, you can also participate and vote questions up and down, right? You probably found that. Um, the question uh, is from Ian Sterling, he's watching, and it kind of has to do with the roles of the different people in the audience, kind of taking the uh, discussion in a different direction. He's saying, how do associations source for a venue or destination, and do venues and convention or tourism bureaus play a role in that and do they promote themselves as much? So this more has to do when this, we talk. So this, this is about venue selection, exactly. uh, decision making. And the role making. of the convention bureau. Uh, th this, is, this was the subject of our two hour uh, online hybrid session last year. Yes, somewhat, he's, he's, but he's let's, let's, back, let's, but yeah. yeah. But uh, let's, let's switch it around slightly to talk about, well, how important can your, your partners be in site selection, decision making? Uh, what's the balance? Uh, so, Karen, you work with uh, PCO on your event. To what extent do you rely on your, the, the, the advice that you get from the, the partner? And to what extent do you control the, uh, the decision making about which city and which major venue you're going to pick? Uh, well, we've uh, done different permutations. So if you are working in collaboration with somebody else, then you're going to have to come up with a uh, a site together that you can um, both agree on. And that certainly happened with our Toronto meeting. Um, so we had our international congress in conjunction with the uh, national meeting for the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. And so that was, a, um, we selected a date that they had their annual meeting so that we would have maximum number of delegates at our meeting and they wouldn't have to be choosing uh, between the two. Um, and that was a strategic decision yeah, that you that made was. as an association. Yep. You didn't involve your, your partner in that right. at that stage. At that stage, no, no. But sometimes you do rely on them. Uh, well, yeah. we've just started to do that. Just so okay. we've recently become a member of uh, the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus uh, Council. And while we have other reasons for becoming a member, um, this is a way that you can advocate globally for, uh, with governments and with the World Health for our common uh, interests. It's also a way to take a look at the meetings that we're doing as well um, to ensure that uh, the collective delegate pool that we're drawing from, we're not going to be putting on conflicting meetings, but also is there some way that we can cooperate on those meetings as well? So if there is a meeting being held, can we put on a subspecialty day um, mm -hmm. that will be held in conjunction with that meeting? Okay, and, and yeah. Finn, within SOMAR, uh, I know we've spoken earlier that, that there's a certain amount of decision making that takes place centrally. You decide pretty much where you want to go for the business reasons that you're addressing, but then how do you get down to the selection of the precise city, the precise venue? Where's your advice come from there? Um, firstly, internally. Okay. Um, bearing in mind that we have a fairly lengthy track record of hosting conferences in different countries. So, uh, as an example, I was chatting yesterday during the RFP workshop. Somebody proposed Berlin. I said, well, actually, you know, we were in Berlin twice in the last 15 years. They were both fantastic conferences, but we should probably not go back to Berlin again. If we were looking at Germany, we'd probably like to try somewhere else. Um, so internally first, secondly would be our representatives, so those uh, members of our membership community who are our, our eyes and ears in the country, and certainly in picking locations in Asia, they've been incredibly beneficial and useful to us. And uh, if both of those options lead down dead ends, then we would certainly go to a, a, a DMC or a PCO in the country and say. But also, I think you, you know ICA, so you've met many of the Convention Bureau leaders, yes. so you have a pretty wide network already to draw on in terms of yes. which potential cities. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. And, and Jano, for your association clients, are you taking a stronger recommendation role than, say, five years ago? Yeah. Is, is, are they listening more to what you say, or are they telling you, we want to go there, and you just make it happen? It, it changed. It, it was like, okay, we want to go to that destination, and let's start negotiating. By now, it's due to bidding. And there might still be in the bidding guidelines, we, we like to receive bids from Asia or from, from Middle East or, or from Africa. 
Americas. So, but, but it changed dramatically because in the way you negotiate, because we're all speaking about partners, outsourcing, and, and, and working together, I, I think you start really early because in a way, if it, it, as, a destina or as an association, you decided on a destination already and, and on the venue, well, e even budget-wise, almost half of your budget is covered already be because a lot goes in there. So your negotiation part, your, your strategic advantage, your communication, uh, how you want to approach it and what, what do you want to achieve with it by going to a destination, Qu quite a lot can be lost already just by the enthusiasm of going somewhere. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that, that adds a bit of strategy and a, another level in, in decision making. What do you want to achieve your, with your ne next destination? Yeah. It, it, I mean, the, the, the simple answer to the, to the question that came up is that the, it's astonishingly complex, the different ways in which different associations make their decisions. Uh, probably the, the easiest way of answering, rather than repeat uh, an hour's worth of discussion from last year, is to refer ICA members to uh, one of the PDFs that we have available for, for members uh, called International Association Bidding and Decision Making. Uh, and that's actually a, in fact, it's also very relevant for all the international associations who are logged in and listening to us at the moment. It's a document that looks at all of the parameters relating to the decision-making process. Uh, it, it breaks down by time and all of the different stages in the process from uh, first calls for bids through to the actual presentation, everything in between. Uh, it looks at the different types of decision-making criteria. Uh, so the primary decision-makers are logistics, which tends to be mainly a shortlisting issue. Um, there are financial issues of all kinds. I think we had about two pages of different financial issues that should really be thought about. Most crucially, uh, and this is where a lot of suppliers in the industries fall, fall down, is the decision-making criteria based on the business objectives of the association. Are they trying to grow membership? Are they trying to spread uh, programs into new markets? Are they looking for business opportunities? Um, are they looking for a destination which will help to fulfill their mission, whether that is training doctors or providing more midwives or uh, increasing technological capability in particular parts of the world? Uh, and many suppliers fail to ask the questions related to those objectives, but that's really critical. And the fourth area of decision-making criteria is actually the political. These are the things you never see in an RFP or a bid document, but they actually determine a great deal of why decisions get made. Uh, so I, I strongly recommend that if you're an ICA member or if you're an association, you can use this to benchmark and check your existing decision-making process because we obviously want to improve it. Uh, and if you're an ICA member, it gives you a, a, a way of identifying what is missing from RFPs, what is missing from bid books, because often it's the things which, as we discussed in the sessions uh, earlier, uh, earlier in this program, it's the things which are not written down, which are missing, that you need to address in order to differentiate your offering, whether it's a destination or a venue, or it's uh, a PCO offering a full outsource service. So getting inside the heads of the individual association and finding out what makes them tick is, is the best advice. And there is no way you can give a short answer on, on that one. How will you inspire the minds of many? Will you provide new perspective that will allow others to see a world full of opportunities? Will you create a voice that captures the imagination of a kingdom? Will you share a welcoming smile that has others feel like royalty? Will you bring the world together via the speed of sound or the hush of a jungle? Will a rich culture and the arts become the fabric of your attendees? Will you stimulate their senses with cuisine envied by the world? Will you forever change the definition of a meeting room? and inspire creativity in the beauty of silence? Will you redefine 
the meaning of work-life balance and create a venue that will have attendees feeling forever connected. Create the moments that inspire the minds of many. Connect people, inspire the world. Thailand.